Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Before we begin, a short prayer. All blessing, honor, glory, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, for now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. I pray to Almighty God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so my power to speak truth without error, and to interpret Holy Scripture correctly. All truth comes from God. Any errors are my own. I also pray that you, the viewer and listener, may likewise be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that any truth I speak or any scripture that I interpret correctly is welcome to your heart, your mind, and your soul. Today's discussion is in the Old Testament Prophecies of Christ playlist and is entitled, The Serpent on a Pole. We're going to begin in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Eden. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Let's connect that to John chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. This is Lord Jesus speaking at night to the Pharisee Nicodemus. If I have told you earthy things, and ye believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. That proves he's divine right there. He's in more than one place at the same time, isn't he? He's speaking to Nicodemus at night, and at the same time he's in heaven. Verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Notice how Lord Jesus is connecting himself to Numbers 21. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but of eternal life. So notice in Numbers 21, the Israelites looked at the serpent of brass, and their sin was cleansed, their wounds were healed, the poison was removed. And notice for us, if we look upon Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross, what? Our sins are forgiven, we're given eternal life, and the poison of Satan, if you want to think of it this way, is taken from us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 through 13. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, speaking of the Israelites in the wilderness. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents, going back to Numbers 21, obviously. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may, that ye may be able to bear it. So notice what St. Paul is teaching, that all of these things that happened to the Israelites happened to teach us, the believers in New, Lord Jesus, the New Testament believers, how to live our lives and how to react to situations, and also in regard to temptation. Notice, God is faithful, God is just. If we have greater temptations, we do have greater power within us, it's our choice whether we use it or not, to escape. And of course, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. That gives us power over our sinful flesh. We need the Holy Spirit, otherwise we can do nothing. 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense. They started worshiping it as a god, as an idol. And he called it Nehushtan. 
He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. So Hezekiah was definitely a very good son of David. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat that spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink, right? What was the spiritual meat? Mana. What was the spiritual drink? The water that came out of the rock. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Notice what's interesting about this. If you go back to Numbers 21, verse 5, notice they loathed the light bread. Lord Jesus is better than the manna from heaven. And they, right, they, they thought there was no water, right? And obviously water came from the rock, which was Lord Jesus. John chapter 6, verses 26 to 34 regarding this bread. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. This is following in, in John's gospel, the feeding of the 5,000 with the um, uh, five loaves and uh, uh, two, two fish and uh, 12, uh, the 12 baskets. You don't have in John's gospel the feeding of the 4,000 with the seven loaves, uh, fish that aren't given a number, and seven baskets. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. So the will of God, the work of God, is to believe upon the Son. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? See and believe very important in John's gospel. What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. That's that light meat that we saw in numbers that they despised. Uh, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. And that's him. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread, still looking at it carnally. Continuing verses 35 to 40. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Because f physical hunger and physical thirst mean nothing in the big picture. Spiritual hunger and spiritual thirst do. But I send to you that ye also have seen me and believe not. Say, so they've seen him, but don't believe. You need to see and believe. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So if you come to him, he's not going to get rid of you, but you can leave him if you want. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. We heard about the work of the Father. Here's the will of the Father. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day, the day of final judgment, the day of the judgment of the sheep and the goats from Matthew 25, the day of the great white throne judgment from Revelation 20. And this is the will of him that sent me, the work of God, the will of God, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him as their Lord and God, by the way, John 20, 28, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Again, notice, see and believe upon the Son, everlasting life, raised into the new creation on the day of final judgment. By the way, you also see that in John's uh, gospel later in this chapter regarding eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Exodus chapter 17, verses 5 through 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod. Now we're going to see the rock that's Christ giving forth the water, representing obviously the Holy Spirit and eternal life. Wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. Sinners, God is saying, I'm going to be that rock. And we're taught over there in 1 Corinthians 10 that that rock was Lord Jesus. There's another proof first that Lord Jesus is God, right? Exodus chapter 17, verse 6, the Lord saying, I will be there in that rock. And then St. Paul teaching that that rock was Christ. So what? Christ the Lord. There's just yet another verse proving it, if you understand Old Testament and New Testament. So there's no way you can say, I believe the Bible and not understand that Lord Jesus is God, just not the same person as the Father. Going back to Exodus 7, 
15, verse 6, Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock and horb, and thou shalt smite the rock, strike it, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? He was in that rock. He's going to give him the water. And notice, he, that for, the, for the water to come out, life, spiritual life, obviously, is the spiritual connection. You had to strike it. It had to be struck. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The God is with us, right? Is the Lord among us or not? When God is with us, right? The God was there at the rock. And by the way, Lord Jesus, the rock, was with us as well. He is the Emmanuel, God with us. And, and you see it prophesied over there in Isaiah 7, 14. Numbers chapter 20, verses 8 through 13. So we saw the first time the rock gave forth water, right? We are Lord God saying, I'll be in that rock. You have to strike me once. Notice what happens in Numbers chapter 20. Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brethren. Speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And that shall bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shall give the congregation and their beasts drink. Interesting. It's the water is going to be for the congregation and the beasts. Earlier, it was just for the congregation, the children of Israel. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fight, fetch you water out of, his rock, out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand. Notice he's upset. He doesn't listen to God. And with his rod, he smote the rock twice. Interesting, these details. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. Again, the details. And the Lord spake unto Moses in there, because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. See, God wanted them to sanctify him by just speaking, and the water would come out. You didn't listen. You didn't do what you were told. You didn't do something that was going to sanctify me and glorify me. You did what you wanted because you were frustrated. Therefore, he shall not bring this congregation to the land which I have given them. So that's why Moses never went into the promised land. Think of how important this is. This is the water of Marabah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. Notice the details. Again, all connected to Lord Jesus. John chapter 17, verse 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified through the truth. So notice, how is he going to sanctify himself? By being crucified. Notice, how was God sanctified? By the rock being smote twice, and water came out abundantly. John chapter 4, verses 7 through 14. Therefore cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water, Jacob's well. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Again, water and meat, water and meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to give me to drink, then wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. He is the rock. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. It's physical water. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, spiritual water, the Holy Spirit, shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Continuing, John chapter 4, verses 31 to 34. Now the disciples show up. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Notice the work and the will again mentioned. We know what the work and the will are, so that people see and believe upon the Son. On the cross, the serpent on the pole, right, to have their sins removed, right, to get eternal life, and to get the poison of Satan extracted from them. Death. John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Notice, he had to be crucified once, right? There were spikes put in his heels and then in his two hands, right, probably at the wrist between the radius and all in the bow. That had to be done the rock was struck once with that crucifixion and 
the water came out the ghost, right? John chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Remember, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Remember, on the seventh day, God rested. God never rested. God's working right now, right? But again, the purpose is the new creation. The seven days were the creation, right? The work for the new creation, for the redemption of mankind, had to be through the Son. So notice, I'm working, my Father's working. Notice he says, it is finished, the work is done. See, everything that had to be done, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world finally entered creation and was slain in creation, and the work is now finished. Genesis chapter two, verse two, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, right? He didn't really end it, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made, right? Obviously, God's working right now, holding our molecules together, but the real work is for the whole purpose, the whole narrative arc of the Bible, right? Beginning with the first creation, beginning with the first marriage of one man to one woman, and the fall. And then, what? Lord Jesus enters creation, right? His death, burial, and resurrection, crucifixion, ascension, right? Gives up the ghost. Had to happen. If we see and believe upon him as our Lord and our God, we'll first be adopted as sons when we get glorified bodies like he has at the rapture, and then we'll marry him, right? Joining the family of God. And then we'll enter the new creation. And that all plays out in the book of Revelation, culminating with the new creation, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, in Revelation chapter 21. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified, right? glorified, sanctified, has to be crucified, has to be struck once on the cross. Pay attention to this. John chapter 19, verses 32 to 37. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with them of these two thieves. Right? It was a holy day. They had to get the bodies off the cross. So these people would suffocate to death. And since they had to get them off the cross, they would break their legs to make them die very quickly. Otherwise, you know, they'd, they'd want it to be excruciating, where, where the you know, term crucifixion cross uh, right, is connected to. Uh, but they had to get them off the cross, so they broke their legs. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break out his legs. See, he gave up his life. He had power to give up his life and power to take it back again. So they didn't break his legs. They didn't have to. So they didn't kill him. He gave up his life. But one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side. Notice they're striking him again. Remember the first time they had to strike him, just like the rock had to be struck, right? And notice he gave up the ghost. The work is finished. Now they're striking him again. They don't need to do this. And forthwith came there out two things, blood and water. Think it's all coincidence, right? Two strikes, water comes out, shouldn't happen. They didn't strike, they should speak. We should speak to Jesus to get the Spirit now, right? To believe upon him. But they struck him and two things came out. Coincidence? I don't think so. And he that saw it, John, bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true that ye might believe. Notice 35. That surely indicates that St. John is saying, hey, what I'm telling you happened in verse 34 is very important. That's why he makes, makes such an emphasis of it in verse 35. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Number one, a bone of him shall not be broken. And another, again, another scripture say, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So that's the piercing. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Here it is. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. Notice, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out. And, they, and it's saying, if you don't, I mean, how can it be that if you understand the Old Testament, you have to see the New Testament? By the way, that to me proves 100% the New Testament is true is the Old Testament. So isn't it funny? There are these blind people who refuse to see and believe upon Lord Jesus, and they'll see this verse and not see the obvious connection. Pay this. Pay, look at that. You think it's a coincidence? And I, this is Lord God speaking, will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. It's going to happen in Jerusalem. The spirit of grace and of supplication, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out, and they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. God's going to be pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, as shall be bitterness for him, as one that in his bitterness for his firstborn. So notice all of that happening. So when God is pierced, so God's going to be pierced, but then God's son's going to be pierced, and they're the same in one way but distinct in another way, at that time the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out. 
and and you don't think that is completely connected to the New Testament because it is. This is not coincidence. The Bible's true. Christianity is true. John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled in fear of the Jews, came Jesus, stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, this is on the uh, day of his resurrection, on the Sunday, on the Lord's day, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father sent me, even so I send you. Notice he said peace twice. You can go back to very early prophecy of this in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, and the Messiah is going to be the Shiloh, peace. And notice, coincidence, no peace. Remember, peace, this is again the problem of thinking the Messiah is going to come to earth and he's going to be a ruler and make peace between men. No, 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 we don't need peace between men. We'll never have peace between men without first having peace between God. We need to reconcile with God. That's the peace, that's the Shiloh, Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the true Messiah. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Notice he's empowering them to remit sins once they're empowered by the Holy Ghost, right? This fountain of water coming out of your belly, right? And by the way, notice the connection, belly, and then when they stabbed him, what came out of his belly, right? When they pierced him, and, right? Do you think that's coincidence? Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. And over the sins you retain, they are retained. Notice the power he gave. God works with mankind. Again, they were going to do the right thing because they were going to have the Holy Spirit of truth guiding them. John chapter 14, verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He dwelleth with you because he was in Lord Jesus at the word, and shall be in you. And you see it playing out right there in John chapter 20, verse 22. Notice, you can't receive him, you can't see him, you can't know him, but you have. You only can do that once you first see and believe upon Lord Jesus and know Lord Jesus, and then you get his spirit, the Father's spirit, his spirit. John chapter 15, verse 26, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 16, verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear. Hear what? The Father and Son speaking, I guess? That shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. That's why we can trust what the early church did, because they were taught by the Spirit of truth. So again, you have to. If you say you believe in the Bible, if you say you believe Sola Scriptura, you have to understand that whatever the early church taught had to be the truth, Right? Lord Jesus promised it. The Holy Spirit promised it. Otherwise, you don't believe in Lord Jesus. You don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't really believe in Scripture, do you? John chapter 20, verse 24 through 29. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came on that first Lord's Day, the day of his uh, resurrection. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, him, them, he's doubting Thomas, except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger to the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side where he was pierced, I will not believe. Noticed the challenge. And after eight days again, his disciples are within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. It's the third time he said, Peace. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be faithless. And, excuse me, and be not faithless, forgive me, but believing. So notice the Lord Jesus just did three miracles right there. Number one, he resurrected himself, right? proving it to Thomas. I mean, from Thomas's perspective, three miracles just happened, three signs just happened right there. Number one, John chapter two, he said he was going to raise the temple of his own body, and he just did. That's a miracle, right? Number two, he appeared in a room when the doors were shut. He physically materialized himself in a room. There's a miracle. And number three, he indicated, he, he, he heard uh, Thomas's challenge when he wasn't even there physically present. So he's proving what? He's divine. He can resurrect himself. He can physically materialize himself. And he can hear you when he wasn't even physically there, right? And Thomas answered and said unto him, this is why Thomas responds this way, my Lord and my God, o mu keo theos mu, the Lord of me and the God of me. Why? You just proved it. You resurrected yourself. You materialized yourself in the middle of the room and you heard me when you weren't physically present. You are divine. You are my Lord and you are my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. 
See, traditional Trinitarian Christians such as myself are blessed because we weren't there in that room in Jerusalem. We didn't physically see him resurrect himself. We didn't physically see him materialize himself in a room. We didn't see him respond to our challenge, and yet we believe that he is our Lord and our God because he is. He's mine, he's yours, he's everyone's. So I pray that was edifying, and yet again you see how, please if you're a, 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 a traditional Trinitarian Christian, or if you have questions, read the Old Testament, and then read the New Testament, go back and forth and back and forth. And if you want to see the truth, you will see the truth, right? God will bless you with the truth. And the truth is that Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord, is your God. The Bible only makes sense when it's in its entirety, Old Testament, New Testament, starting in Genesis 1, ending in Revelation 22. Amen. I pray I spoke truth and interpret Holy Scripture correctly so that this discussion might have been a blessing to you, the viewer and listener. All truth comes from God. Any errors were my own. If it was a blessing to you, I would greatly appreciate if you could like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Lord willing, we shall meet again. May the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless us all. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.